the Fed, you know, is, you know, at the height of the pandemic panic, going back to 2020, the Fed's balance sheet was up to about nine trillion dollars. I had to get used to saying trillion instead of billion, but about nine trillion dollars. And it's come down a little bit uh, since then. But uh, people say, well, wait a second. How can there be a dollar shortage or a liquidity crisis when the Fed printed nine trillion dollars? Well, the answer is you have to understand how the money system works and where real money creation comes from and it does not come from the fed and here's why the fed did print the money that's that's real but the way they do it they the fed buys bonds and treasury notes from the primary dealers from the big banks and the you know they call up and offer me a 10-year note okay here's the price done the goldman sachs will send the 10-year note to the fed and the fed pays for it with money that comes out of thin air so that is money printing it's as simple as that but then goldman sachs in my example takes the money and gives it back to the Fed because the Fed's a bank. They deposit it at the Fed in the form of what they call excess reserves. And the Fed pays interest on excess reserves. So the Goldman's actually making money off it. The point is the money didn't go anywhere. The Fed did create it out of thin air. That much is true. But the recipient who sold the bonds gives it back to the Fed. It sits on the Fed's balance sheet. So the asset side, you've got all these treasury notes, but the liability side, you've got all these deposits. And it just sits there and it doesn't do anything. So where is the real money that powers the economy? If there is, you know, if if it does at all, where does that come from? It comes from the banks because the banks can do the same thing. When the bank makes you a loan, what do they do? They, your business, you set up a checking account. They say, okay, here's a million dollar loan. They put the million dollars in, in your checking account. Where'd that money come from? They just, they just, said you got the money right and so they have an asset which is a loan from you with note and they got a liability which is your deposit so banks create money kind of the same way the fed does except it's supposed to be in private commerce and that money actually can go somewhere if you're a business you got a payroll you got to buy stuff or invest stuff etc but that's there's not much of that going on velocity is very low the turnover of money is low but uh, the point is that doesn't that hasn't really been going anywhere now but here's the key Nine trillion dollars on the balance sheet, maybe, you know, five, six trillion today. It's a lot of money. But the notional value of derivatives off balance sheet of the banks is one quadrillion dollars. And for listeners who might not have heard the word quadrillion before, one quadrillion is a thousand trillion. So your nine trillion at the Fed doesn't get you very far if you have to support one thousand trillion dollars worth of derivatives. And how does that work well the answer is mostly the banks uh doing off balance sheet swaps and swaptions and uh other futures and forwards and you know we don't have to go down the whole litany of names with either each other because they're trading firms or with hedge funds who want them for speculation or hedging or sovereign wealth funds or other institutions there's a whole network of, of participants but these are the big boys these are the the the, the trillion dollar institutions the you know black rock and uh the temasek and the sovereign wealth fund of norway the, 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 these are the 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 big players involved in this market okay so you have a thousand trillion dollars of derivatives off balance sheet by the way you will not see this looking at a bank balance sheet you got to read the footnotes you got to know what you're looking at how is that supported well it's supported with collateral not 100 percent, not even close but maybe one percent two percent you got to put up some margin money to be in the game but then you can have a lot more off balance sheet okay so what's the best form of collateral well it depends it, it, whether you're in a liquidity crisis or not whether people are feeling confident or are worried whether they think things are going to go great or start to collapse so as things get more difficult and that's the phase we're in right now uh the um the the quality of the collateral has to go up you know so the banks are now saying to each other i don't want your mortgages i don't want your stupid corporate bonds i don't even want 10-year treasury notes get me bills treasury bills these are short-term very liquid one year maturity or less a lot of them are four week bills eight week bills six month bills these are very short term very liquid they are the best collateral there is and the banks are saying to each other that's what i want okay so now you're barclays bank or deutsche bank or unicredit credit swiss or bank you know uh some major japanese bank etc where are you going to get the bills well you got to buy them from a dealer or you can buy them at auction the treasury has auctions or you can get them from the Fed. But to buy a dollar-denominated treasury bill, you need dollars. So 
That's that's why the dollar is so strong. Everyone's like, hey, Jim, you know, we got these huge budget deficits and trillion dollars of expenses and bailouts and handouts and, um, you know, 131 percent debt to GDP ratio, uh, 31 trillion dollars in debt, um, you know, et cetera. How can the dollar be so strong? Well, the answer is it has nothing to do with everything I just said. The dollar is strong because everybody in the world needs dollars to buy treasury bills to prop up the balance sheets of the one quadrillion of derivatives that nobody can see. And this is real. This is way behind the curtain, Ken. This is real inside baseball in terms of how the international monetary system actually works. So the the strength of the dollar, which, by the way, is a headwind for gold. You know, the euro's down, sterling's down, um, the Swiss francs are down. Gold hasn't actually gone down a lot. It hasn't gone up a lot, but it's kind of it's holding its own. But a strong dollar means anything denominated in dollars is going to go down because if the dollar gets stronger, the dollar price of the commodity gets lower or at least doesn't go up a lot. Okay, so you got to, first of all, you got a mad scramble for dollars. Why? To buy treasury bills. Why? Because they're the only collateral to prop up everything I just described. Now, but there's evidence of this. And again, you have to know where to look. So right now, the Fed has what they call the reverse repo, repo program. What is that? Well, any bank, any major institution that wants treasury bills can call the Fed and say, Give me some treasury bills and you give the Fed cash. You know, it can be overnight or a couple of days or whatever. The Fed pays you interest, so you're making a little money. Then they send you the treasury bills. Well, why isn't that the solution? Why, why, why doesn't that work? Well, the answer is you can do that and you can get those treasury bills, but you cannot rehypothecate them. You cannot pledge them to anybody else. You have to keep them. And the Fed might want to unwind that at any time. Well, that's not good enough because if I'm supporting some other transaction with somebody else and they're supporting another transaction through a chain of could be 25 banks all in the same, you know, back to back, I want treasury bills that I can pledge to Credit Suisse so they can pledge to Barclays so they can pledge to JP Morgan, et cetera. So I got to get treasury bills either at auction from the treasury and they're not issuing that many because actually the, the you know, budget deficit is coming down a little bit uh, or I buy them in the secondary market. Just to put some data behind this, Robert, just to show it's not a theory. So I can, if I'm a bank, I can call up the Fed and get treasury bills, you know, in 15 minutes and there's a certain price. They're going to pay me interest. I'm going to get a discount and give it back. If I buy it in the treasury market, there's also a price. I got to, you know, they, they always trade, they, they mature at par. So you buy them at a discount and the difference is how much interest you make. Okay. The interest, the yield to maturity on the treasury bill that you buy in the secondary market is lower than what the Fed will give you for free just by picking up the phone. So why would you ever buy a treasury bill in the secondary market with a lower yield than what the Fed will hand you? Well, the answer is because you can rehypothecate it. You're desperate. You need, you want that you're willing to take less yield to get the one that you can pledge instead of getting a higher yield for the one you can't pledge. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the rehypothecations. But the point being, the fact that yields on secondary market purchases are lower than what the Fed will give you for free tells you how desperate people are to get those bills. So that's causing a liquidity crisis. That's the beginning of a liquidity crisis. And and, and that's what you're warning everybody about right now. Right. I mean, you, I, you want a lot of things. I spoke to someone recently. I said, well, Jim, I, I hear you. When's all this coming to a head? And I said, maybe yeah. this winter or this spring, sooner yeah. than you think. And and I based that on the last two super liquidity crises when the world almost completely collapsed, or maybe it did, were 1998, that was long-term capital management in Russia, and 2008 during right. Lehman Brothers. But I remind people, Sunday, September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy on, electronically on a Sunday night. And that was like, we all know what happened next. But that crisis started in 2007. Remember August 9th, 2007, Jim Cramer and Aaron Burnett on oh, CNBC, right. and he's yelling, they know nothing, they know nothing. Well, he was right. They didn't know anything. They were idiots, I mean, they, meaning the Fed. Um, but and then, then you know, Hank Paulson and the Super Civ and the Sovereign Wealth Fund bailout and then Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. And so there was a lot leading up to the Lehman Brothers, but it took a year. It took a year to go around. Uh, same thing with long-term capital. It, it came to a head in September 1998. We were hours away from shutting every financial market in the world. We got the $4 billion in, stabilized the balance sheet, and life went on. But it was a really close call. But that started in June 1997. When Thailand broke the peg to the dollar, started to right. run on the bank in Thailand, it right. spread to Malaysia, 
Indonesia, South Korea, you know, you always hear the expression, right. you, time to buy is when there's blood in the streets. Well, sadly, there was blood in the streets, real blood in Korea because people got killed. And then it went to Russia, then long-term capital. But my point is, the everyone knows the, the acute stage, September 98 or September 2008, but it began a year earlier. So now everything we, we've just been talking about is already happening. It's been happening since last spring. So if you stick to this one year rule, and it's not a hard and fast scientific rule, but it, we've seen two cases where it took a year to come around. If that's your rule and it started in March 2022, and there's good evidence for that, then kind of March 2023 is your D-Day. 